All right, welcome back to episode 26 of the More Doors podcast today. We have a great guest on. We have Bronson Hill from Bronson Equity, and we're going to get started right now. You're going to want to tune into this one. All right, welcome back. Episode 26 today. We're excited about the guest that we have on today. Brian, he is over uh, 2,000 doors. Something like, I yeah. mean, I think it might be like 50,000. But Yeah, something like, <laughs> yes. Between that, between 2,000 and 50,000 doors. We're excited to have Bronson Hill on from Bronson Equity. Um, but of course, before we get into that... Right. We got it. We got to thank our sponsors of the show. Otherwise, this wouldn't happen. And if it didn't, it wouldn't look as well as it as it's as it looks when you're listening to it or the mm -hmm. audio or anything like that. So number one, Jesse, our producer from Tour Studios, just go to tourstudios.com. If you're wanting to create content just like this, if you're wanting to have a podcast just like this so that you become the market expert in whatever field that you're in. Look, you're probably wanting to invest some money too, right? So you're probably, that's why you're listening to the show. Yeah. So I don't know what you do for a living, but if you do want to become that market expert in whatever field that you're in, just go to tourstudios.com. Jesse can set you up on a podcast, get you some reels going, and uh, maybe even handle some social media stuff. Absolutely. And when you're done there and you're hooked up with your new podcast that you're hosting, go and check out deepbluere.com. That's the whole home of Deep Blue Capital. If you are looking to grow your income passively, build generational wealth, check out what we're doing over at Deep Blue Capital. Visit deepbluere.com. It's going to be a heck of a of a 2024 the winds of change are here we're very excited to bring new wealth building opportunities to our investment partners so check out deepbluere.com all right done with the commercials yeah let's do it yeah I'm, I'm excited about this this one here we have let's uh jesse let's bring uh bronson on so bronson hill from bronson equity and um i was reading your journey bronson and and going through your bio but what i really want to do instead of me just reading off something boring Right. Like people, they're like, uh, you know, they give mm -hmm. all the flash stuff you know, to read off. Why don't you tell us, give us that 60 second version of, of who you are and and what were you what were you doing to get started into you know multifamily investing? And welcome to the show, by the yeah, way. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Sorry. Thanks so much, guys. Good to be here. I can tell you guys have been doing this for a long time, a long time uh, you know, spending together. You feel super comfortable. So yes, love sir. that. Love being on a show like this. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I uh a little bit of my story, I was a well-paid medical device sales professional, so I was making over 200K a year, um, working with mostly with surgeons and heart surgical products. And it was great, except I didn't have control of my time. I had to go to work. And I wanted to, a lot of people think of you know financial freedom, but really what we want is uh, time freedom. And so uh, I just kept trying to look into ways to create passive income or investment income. Uh, started with single family, found my way to multifamily, uh, found a way to start scaling up. I, I didn't really know much about multifamily, but I had a cousin who'd been doing it for years. And I said, I don't have the money to do this. It seems like you kind of graduate from single family to multifamily. But he said, no, you can raise the money. So I learned about something called syndication, which is uh, raising money or, or investing passively in a larger deal. And uh, there's usually a, you know, limited partners who invest money and people that operate those deals. And uh, now we've, we've raised uh, over $40 million for uh, multifamily. We've also done ATM machines and car washes and oil and gas, and we've kind of done some different stuff. So I was able to leave my great corporate job about two and a half years ago. I uh, just wrote a book recently called Fire Yourself in the background here, actually over here. I point the right <laughs> way. And uh, anyway, I've been really excited to be here. I love talking all things real estate, finance, uh, investing, and super excited to be on the show today. I love it. I love it. I, I do want to, you know, something that we've, we've started doing with the show when we have guests on is I want to I want to have you take us on the journey of you were like you said you were a highly paid medical sales consultant medical consultant and making over two hundred thousand dollars a year. That's that's a hard you know with that type of income you're making it's hard to probably transition out into full time real estate. Can you can you take us on that journey a little bit? Yeah, so it's interesting. My my family is mostly I mean they're great, but they're all teachers and work for nonprofits and just like the. 
uh, the rich dad, poor dad, right? The safe, secure job with benefits, right? That's mm -hmm. like my family. My dad's a college professor, similar to uh, the, the author, rich dad. You know, it's just like, like the security, wanting that security. So when I started saying, hey, I'm thinking about leaving my job, whatever, they're all like, no, don't leave your great job. Why would you ever, <laughs> ever do that? And it became the golden handcuffs. And I realized um, it, it, a lot of times if we're not raised around, you know, we're not around enough friends, we know people that are entrepreneurs or are really doing things that are at the next level, um, it doesn't have to be just in this example, but in other examples, um, then we really are limited by who we're around. There's a saying that you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. So I realized I had to get around other people. So I joined a group that has uh, a mastermind for entrepreneurs. And I got in a room with, with five other uh, entrepreneurs. And I basically explained, here's my business. Here's what I want to do. I want to leave. And um, after spending about a year with these guys, I kind of just explained the whole business plan and everything. And they're like, you know, you should leave your job pretty much as soon as possible. And, you know, it, it may not work, but um, you could always go back to medical sales. And it just kind of gave me like, oh, yeah, I, I could always, <laughs> oh, yeah, I could go back to medical sales. So a lot of times I think in, in our mind, if we don't see a way forward, we don't have people around us that can help us on that journey, um, it, we can just kind of get stuck in fear and analysis paralysis. And I see a lot of people with analysis paralysis, not only like myself or you guys that are doing active deals, but people that are even passively investing or thinking about passively investing because everything's weird until you get started in it or you've done it. Or, you know, I heard about syndication. I thought, is this like a crime syndicate or what is it like? I just didn't even know the word syndication or a TV show or something like, what is this? But as I learned about it, and again, sometimes you move towards something that sounds interesting, you get to know different people. You hear about people that have done it, have left their job, have started to invest in this way and it starts to normalize everything for it. So it's been, it's been quite a journey. It's been a lot of fun. It has been, you know, it's super easy, but it's been fun and it's been great and I've learned a lot and I'm just loving it. So how, how long was that process though? So you, you got in the, the mastermind group, they're like, yeah, Bronson, definitely. You should quit your job. <laughs> you know, what's You've been here for an hour. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> you know, you can always go back to that other job. Right. And, and look, that sounds super simple. Um, but you know, when you're in the mix of it, I know like even Matt's brought it up on, on the show that, you know, he's got, you know, we both, we all have our, our regular, our daytime jobs. Brian and I run residential real estate teams and have other, have other businesses. Matt, you know, works for a technology company. And so that's a hard part to do. So how long did it take you in between? All right. You went to this mastermind. They, you presented your business plan and said, you know, I, I want to do this in five years. They said you should quit sooner or whatever that may be. So from, 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 that process to and you know your first deal to now full time what what did that time frame look like yeah so when i first got started i was you know i've been doing single family stuff for a while um i you know i had this conversation with my cousin who's a multifamily guy i started basically devouring any book i could find on multifamily and they all started talking about starting a meetup so i, I live in los angeles los angeles area so i started a local meetup i went to somebody who had a meetup in real estate uh, topics and events and, you know, had a pretty good brand. And I said, hey, what if we start another meetup that was only on multifamily and you just show up and I'll do all the work, we'll co-brand it. And so we did it and I promoted the heck out of it. We had 60 people at the first meeting. And at that first meeting, um, a guy shows up that I never met before. And he's like, hey, you know, Bronson, I, I, I do one of your deals. And I'm looking at like, are you are you talking to me? Like, <laughs> like who is this guy? And so he's never met me before. But it's interesting. There's a difference between being an expert and being a leader. Right. So an expert is somebody who just knows everything about that topic, whatever. A leader is just somebody who's leading and innovating in that space. So I wasn't an expert. Right. But I was a leader. So I was in the front of the room. I was doing interviews with with high level people in that space. So this guy, he decided to invest. I found another guy who, who had a deal and I basically connected the two of them. And so I raised one hundred thousand dollars for my first deal. That's the hardest part of raising money or getting started in larger deals is getting that first deal going from zero to one. So I got that done. And then over the next six months, I just tried to learn as much as I can, look at as many deals as I could, went to events, conferences, different things. I found myself in March of 2019 uh, on a investor cruise. Uh, it was very, it's about $7,000 for me to go. And I ended up having a conversation with a guy that, that I kind of knew a little bit about, but I basically approached him. I literally pitched him at the martini bar, one of the last days of this week long cruise. <laughs> and I said, hey, how's it going in this area in your business and raising money? And we basically formed a partnership to be able to work together. So he had this big brand of helping people to actually raise money themselves. But I said, what about all the people that the doctors, the lawyers, the people are listening and they don't want to do it, right? They don't want to actually do the work. And so um, he said, that sounds like a great idea. So we basically formed a plan. So while working my full-time job, I had uh, a thousand one-on-one -on -one phone calls with high net worth investors over the next 18 months. And we raised $15 million together, right? So I went from basically not doing anything to basically within two years, having done all this, 
Um, and it was a hustle, right? It was a grind. I was working my full-time job. Sometimes getting about 6 a.m. doing these calls. And medical sales, I had a lot of time in the car. So I'd schedule it when I knew I had time in the car. So I'd be doing calls in the car. I'd step out and do a call. Or sometimes I'd do, you know, 14 or 20 calls on a Tuesday. I'd just try to fit them in whenever I could. And I'd made the decision I wanted to leave my job within three years. And just about three years to the month, I was able to leave my job. But it basically came from scaling up the income that came from these deals and also the equity and being able to replace not just not necessarily my income initially, but replace my um, uh, my expenses. Right. That's the most I think the most important number is replacing your expenses. If you replace your expenses and however you live, uh, you don't have to go to work anymore, which is amazing. So that's that's a little bit of the journey. Ooh, there's so I love that story, man. Thank you so much for sharing. That is, I have like nine things I want to dive into. So I'll take them one at a time. One, I just I can't tell you how many times we talked about starting a crime syndicate. So we need to get the process involved in that. That's um, what we're doing here, right? That's what this exactly, is. Exactly, right? This is this your initiation. Uh, <laughs> exactly. uh, man, I, I, I have so many jumping off points that I want to dive into, but I, I think what you what you just said, I just want to backtrack about 30 seconds and and kind of epitomize everything that you just kind of shared in your story there, which is a lot of work, a lot of, uh, you're very opportunistic. Um, you took that leap of faith, you got past the analysis paralysis, all that type of stuff. But what you just kind of epitomize in the last 30 seconds there is you actually also just did the day to day consistent work that any human being can do. It's just one of those things that when we have that bit of imposter syndrome, which I, 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 um, I'd like to dive into that a little bit as well. Later, I saw a post that you made on LinkedIn the other day. Um, it feels uncomfortable to do those relatively simple, consistent tasks that lead to massive results over time because we feel like those tasks um, they're not for us. That life that we're trying to chase is not for us. We, we, we belong in the safe zone. We belong in medical sales where we're comfortable. We belong in that thing that we already are an expert at, right? And having a thousand conversations in 18 months is actually something anyone can do. In fact, we already organically have more than a thousand conversations in a year and a half. It's just normally with people we already know and they exist in our comfort zone. What you did was you decided, I have a vision for what I want my life to look like. And between me and that vision is a thousand conversations with high net worth individuals. And I realize and recognize that some of those might feel awkward at first and they're gonna be uncomfortable because I don't have the track record just yet that I like to have. I might not have the confidence that I need. I might even ask questions or say things that make me sound dumb at times, but I'm going to do it anyway. And here you are a thousand plus conversations later, raising $15 million just in that year and a half, $40 million total now, living an entirely different life. You are doing what, um, you know, Joe Fairless talked about this in, in one of his first books, and he's talked about it on his podcast a lot, being a thought leader, right? Yeah. And I like to think that we've done that here in, in our real estate careers with our other podcasts as well. Whenever Nick and I started that other podcast seven years ago, neither of our real estate careers were where we wanted them to be at the time. We weren't unsuccessful, but we were relatively middle of the road as far as the real estate space. But we started this podcast and it's allowed us to learn and grow. And in the seven years that we've been doing it, our businesses have grown like 10x um, because you put yourself into proximity of people that you expand your network with and you expand your knowledge base with. And it gives you the confidence to take action. I'm sure over that thousand conversations, you became way more energized and confident around what you were doing. And now you are not just a thought leader. You're also a very successful investor. You manifested this. So I know that I'm just kind of telling your story for you, but I want that to land with people that that's an incredible story that you just shared. But when you boil it down, you saw what you wanted your life to look like. And then you did the little consistent things that you needed to do every day. And you lived your life in a way that was extraordinary on a consistent basis. And sometimes extraordinary is just spending that time in the car when you could be listening to music making your phone calls so you can live that vision that you have in the future. And that's, that's, I commend that because that's, that's an incredible journey, man. Thanks. Thanks brother. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's interesting, you know, recently I was able to write a book, which uh, is behind me here, go fire yourself. And, you know, people say, Oh, how do you write a book? Whatever. And it, 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 anything feels daunting until you do it, but yeah. it's actually not that hard to write a book. It just takes like what I did. This is what I, first of all, what it is, uh, Tony Robbins, I'm a big personal development guy. So he talks about, you know, it's in your moments of decision, that your destiny is shaped, right? When I made a decision, I was going to leave my job within three years, like it actually started to happen. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just kind of started to take actions 
to work toward that. And um, I think, you know, I have this saying that life has an action bias. So let's say you have two people and one has incredible vision and incredible strategy and everything. And they, and they, they, they have all these great ideas, but the second person just kind of knows where they want to go, but they just start taking action today and they take action every day. The second person is just taking action. We'll figure it out. They'll, they'll, and it, it's not just taking the same action. It's kind of going back and reflecting and well, what worked, did this not work, whatever, and then finding what works and just going hard towards it. So with the book, I basically, I travel quite a bit, but I was on a trip to Patagonia you know, after I quit my job all this time. So I went to Patagonia, Chile and was doing a hiking trip. And on the way there, I was, I outlined kind of the chapters of the book, right? So then when I came back, um, and I think I got this, somebody mentioned this, but um, that I'd, I'd heard it, but if uh, I set a timer five days a week for 60 minutes, so I would literally just set a timer on my phone and I would just start typing and start writing that chapter. And I would write And some days I would write a few hundred words. Some days I'd write 1200 words, but I just, I just write. And after about two months, I basically had the book pretty much done. I mean, there were some things that had to get done, but for the most part, it was kind of done. And so I realized like, you know, anything, if you just take steady action at it, things that seem to be impossible, become doable. But it's a lot of times it's, we don't, you know, th that, that took, you know, months of, of just kind of doing it on my own, but you know, and you can kind of break that down to a lot of different things, whether it's starting your own real estate thing or a business or whatever, just, just break it down into little bite-sized actions and then start moving towards it. I just took a note of that on my phone while you're talking. Yeah. I just took 60 minutes and just write. Like, I don't, I want to expound upon that later in my, in my own life, but that was such yeah. a good tip. I like to compare it to, I, I talk about this sometimes, uh, uh, a, a, a golf hole. So we are standing on the tee box and we're and our, our job is to get to, to get the ball in the hole. We play sports and there's a score that's kept. And so what we want to do is get it in the fewest amount of shots in real life. That's not the case at all. We just have a vision for where we want to go. And our job is to get there. And the difference between golf and life is the more action that I take, the sooner I'll get there. In golf, if I get it in less than three shot or four shots, it's a birdie. If it's too many, then I fail and all that type of stuff. But if there's two golfers sitting on a tee and the goal is just to get it in the hole as, as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible, if I just hit my first shot into the woods, but I keep moving and I keep hitting shots, I'm going to get the ball in the hole a hell of a lot sooner than the guy that takes 35 minutes to hit his first tee shot because he's continuing to back off and line it up and play with the wind and get in his head. And you're like, just hit the ball in real life. It doesn't matter how many strokes you take, but that's the analysis paralysis part is we hate the feeling of failure so badly. We hate feeling dumb. We hate feeling uncomfortable. We hate being in the woods of life. We hate feeling lost. And so we'll stand on the tee box and talk about hitting this golf shot for like three decades. And then we'll look back and wish we had just swung the club. And that's what I love about the difference between the journey of life as opposed to a sport. If you just tee off, you're one shot closer to getting in the hole. That's 100% true. There's this quote, I was looking for it by Michael Jordan, where it says something like, you know, you miss 100% yeah. of the shots you don't take. And uh, I mean, it was Wayne Gretzky, but he says this, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. And that's why I'm successful, right? The idea of just like taking the shots, being willing to fail. And I, I have the, the, the theory that the more willing you are to be rejected or fail, the more successful you'll be because you'll just, you'll learn, you know, you know, oh, that didn't work. Let's try this, whatever. And you don't look at anything. I think when I was younger, I looked at like, if you have a, a setback or failure, then it means, oh, I'm a failure. I, I can't do this or whatever. But that's just learning. Like, that's how we learn to walk, right? <laughs> there, so you there. just reframe it that everything's learning and everything's getting you closer to your goal. Even Thomas Edison said, you know, like, hey, we failed. You know, one of his assistants were like, hey, we failed 3,000 times doing this, whatever. He said, no, we learned 3,000 times how not to make electricity. Oh, right? like so it's the same thing. It's just being willing to take the shots. It's so true. I, I, there's two things that I think really successful people always say when you ask, you know, like, what is, you know, call, what is your secret or whatever, right? Uh, and one of them is never like, oh, I'm just like highly talented and way smarter than you. It's always, I ask really good questions and I'm not afraid of rejection or failure. And if you just ask a thousand people that are wildly successful, their answers will be some things right and it's just amazing how you can hear the same answers from people over and over and over and, and realize like just take action and 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 allow yourself to be a little uncomfortable and man does the world open up for you
Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it really is. It's just, you know, that's why I think, uh, again, I think we're just trained through school. We're trained through uh, work as, you know, like it, it's a very different mindset. There's a great book by uh, another book by Robert Kiyosaki called Before, I, Before You Quit Your Job. Hmm. And it basically talks about the employee mindset. The employee mindset is if I make too many mistakes, what will happen? I'll get fired, right? Yeah. Uh, well, as, a, as an entrepreneur, which if you're in real estate, if you're, you know, you, you want to start something on your own, you want to invest, you you, may, you are an entrepreneur. And so the an entrepreneur mindset is, is making, being willing to make a lot of mistakes and then quickly learning. Yeah. And he describes it like, um, you know, you're jumping out of a, an airplane without a parachute and you're trying to assemble one before you hit the ground, <laughs> uh, which sounds kind of scary. You know, honestly, it does. But, um, you know, it, it's something and that's obviously an extreme way to look at it. But just the idea that, you know, there is a different mindset for an employee that, you know, if you make mistakes, you get fired as an entrepreneur, you make mistakes and you, and you learn. And, and that's kind of the process. And it, it starts when you're incredibly young. I mean, that's how we groom employees from when they're children. It's, you know, if you don't get 70% or better on this test, you are, you get an F and F stands for failure. And we are trained since we are little kids all the way up until college and beyond that if you don't get 70% of the answers right, then, then you failed. As opposed to, I'll give you a really quick example. I, I talk about this in residential real estate all the time. If you want to make $250,000 as a residential real estate agent, I can show you a math equation where all you do is call for sale by owners all day. If you set five appointments a week just to talk to for sale by owners and keep them in your pipeline, you could fail to convert one of them into a listing 95% of the time. But if you assume that you convert 5% of the time and then off of each of those listings, you at least capture one buyer lead that closes you will make $250,000 a year. But the only caveat there is you've got to wrap your head around failing 95% of the time to achieve your goal. You have to be willing to fail, just like Michael Jordan, to be really yeah. successful. And that's a tough thing for people to go all the way through school until they're at least 18 and then revert to that mindset, which is very difficult. Yeah. So, so and, Bronson... And Go, go ahead. Yeah. No, real quick. I want to, cause you know, I want to, you know, while, while this is, I love this conversation. I want to evolve into how does this transform into you guys doing your first deal, right? You said you, you raised a hundred thousand, which that's, you know, you, like you said, that was the, the, that was the beginning of the toughest part, right? You ripped the bandit yeah. off. You did it. What did that deal look like? You raised a hundred thousand. What was that investment in? Yeah. So again, um, I, I thought I needed, uh, but I think because I started a single family, there's this thought, in real estate, oh, I've got to do everything myself. And when it comes to multifamily, it is such a team sport. I mean, you get over uh, 50 to 100 units, it's always multiple people. It's very, very rare that one person kind of does everything. Yeah. Uh, but single family, you can do it. You know, I had a small single family portfolio, I was doing a lot of it. So what I started to see in the books and learning, whatever, I was like, okay, well, this seems like even the stories people would share, I was like, oh, they have partners and they do things. Like, okay, well, that's interesting. And it sounds a little scary. What if a partner does something crazy? But, you know, I'll, I'll look into it. So what I did is, again, I had this guy who wanted to invest. And again, in that same room where I met him, there was a guy who had a deal who was looking for money, right? So a lot of, you know, capital raising and getting you know, in these deals or, or, you know, being a part of larger deals is just simply finding, like connecting somebody who has money with somebody who has a deal. So I had a guy, there was a guy in that room who had a deal in Texas. It was in Amarillo, Texas, 225 units. And he was raising, I think around $3 million, a little over $3 million. And so, you know, basically I got involved in the project. I said, I want to try to raise some money. And I, I had, a, it wasn't just this one guy, I had him investing, but I had, you know, at the time I had a bunch of conversations with friends and family and I kept track of the number. It was 62 conversations or in-person meetings with friends and family. And the challenge when you first start is people didn't know me as real estate Bronson, right? Or, or investment. They knew me as, as medical sales Bronson, right? It's almost like if you go to your, your, your car repair guy you've worked with for 10 years and you, you have him fix your car and he says, hey, let me tell you about this real estate deal. Right. It doesn't really make sense. You've never talked about real estate, whatever it is. You're like, dude, fix my car, man. What's going on? So like, <laughs> telling the story of who you are is a whole thing. And that's why it's hard to get started because people don't see you as an industry expert. So the way to change that is what you were talking about and Joe Fairless and some of the stuff about how do you start putting yourself as an expert, as a leader. And so being in the front of the room helps. 
uh, also starting to create content and getting involved with different people and posting and this kind of stuff. That's why people start to see you in a different light. So that's for a lot of people, that's kind of the hardest thing is changing the story that people tell when they when they think about you. Like if they think about, oh, you know, you guys are you do this in real estate, whatever, and you have an advantage because you are in real estate. I wasn't in real estate, except that I owned a few things. And so it began, it kind of started from telling that story. That deal went very well. We had a nice returns on that. There were some challenges along the way, but we had some nice returns on it at the, at the end. And so over time, it just developed a track record. And I started to be able to tell that story, started to be able to network with more people. And then, of course, making that next partnership, I was able to leverage someone else's credibility, right? So it didn't matter. The whole thing is, if I'm new to this, then why would somebody invest with Bronze? He doesn't have any experience in this. Why would anybody do that? Well, one of my partners had, you know, over 10 years of experience managing large multifamily deals. So sometimes we think, uh, you know, we have to do everything back to everything, but you don't, right? I had all these sales skills. And, and when you're raising money, it really is a sales skill, right? It's a sales skill to be able to work with people and, and give good customer service and figure out what they need, put them into a product or something. That's the same thing what we're doing if we raise money for larger deals. And so I realized I could bring that and I just needed to find really experienced and operators that had similar partners that had similar values in that space. And so really, I think team was a big part of being able to help me grow. A hundred percent. And I mean, just to, to, to um, emphasize that a little bit, one of the things that I found that I, I want to give our listeners, you know, some insight to, especially coming from the single family side, when you're doing the single family deals, one of the biggest things about transitioning from that into multifamily is it feels like it takes a long time to establish a track record because in single family, it actually kind of does. If I'm going to go and flip or build a rental portfolio or try to wholesale deals or something like that, um, I could go and I could work with, uh, you know, a, a realtor, a broker, a wholesaler, uh, whoever to find deal flow. And I could do a couple deals, but it's, it's so accessible. Single family is something that there's a big demographic of buyers for that before I really get what I call kind of the, you know, first crack at things or get an advantage or kind of get that privilege of, 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 of my track record, helping me to establish my big, my business on a deeper level. I've really got a, establish myself with lots of deals I've because there's just too many people that uh, a realtor or a wholesaler or whoever can go and sell a deal to that for them to come to you first, you know, you've really got to have deep roots with that person. It takes time to build. What I found after my first deal as a GP is that there are a lot of people that are interested in multifamily, but not committed. And once you actually make that commitment and close a big deal, even if it's your first deal, you start to get into a different, more rare type of company in the, in the investor world. And brokers want to work with people that can close. And so once you rip that Band-Aid off and you get past interested to committed and you get that first deal done, it's not like single family where you're still scraping to get um, you know a little bit more of a leg up you start to develop race relationships much more quickly when you have that track record. It, it doesn't take nearly as, as many deals to build your track record in multifamily as it does in single family. And so I, I just want that to kind of be something that our listeners hear and understand because I know that the journey seems like it's a million miles long and it is, but it gets exponentially easier once you pull that bandaid off. And I don't know if you found the same thing, Bronson, but I, I certainly experienced that in our career. Yeah, yeah, it, it absolutely is. I mean, it's it's you know everything is is difficult until you get started, and then when you have either you have the experience or a partner has the experience, it doesn't have to all be your experience. But um, so I, yeah, I think when it comes to it, um, you know, I thought I had to bring everything, but you know, you, you figure out what you have, and that's what um, you know. I, I worked with a lot of physicians for a while, or a lot of business owners or professionals, and it's like a lot of people have the ability to manage things well, right? So that could be on the operations side, right? Or they have other skills they could bring to be able to do that. And so there are different skills people can bring that allow them to really add value to a team. And so that's, you know, and the amazing thing is when you go larger deals, as you get better management, and so it's easier, I think, to manage, it's far easier to manage 100 units in one location rather than 100 houses all over town, right? Just because you get a discount on the management instead of 10% typical fees, you get maybe it's, you know, two to 4% typically. And then you have on-site staff, you've got on-site maintenance, you get a discount on their, uh, their rate because they're all, um, you're paying, you know, 
you're paying a salary for them rather than hourly. Typically, there's one type of appliance usually or, you know, a couple of just very few types of appliances, same paint colors, those kind of things, same plumbing. So it's just much more efficient. So I think, um, you know, the partnerships, I think, is, is one of the best ways, I think, to grow quickly uh, and just realizing it doesn't have to be all you. And that's hard for me being uh, it was what's hard for me being a sales guy where I was successful because I controlled every part of the process. Right. I controlled this and I was able to work with these physicians and, you know, get more sales and go to these procedures. And I was able to do a lot of it myself. But to grow, we've got to learn to be able to bring partners, other people in that have different skill sets than we do and that can complement us. Um, not just tell us we're amazing, but um, they can complement our skill set <laughs> and uh, and tell us we're amazing. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love that's so true. I always laugh when people talk about the property management side and how you can manage more doors in one place. I only say that because we we we're, we're very blessed to own a residential property management company as well, and our PM yes. is sitting in the other room right now, and it's normally chaos when we go in there because yeah. it's, it's yeah. such a high octane business and high stress all the time. It's good to be an owner on it, but not good to be the PM. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. We take good care of them. Yes. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit because we've talked a lot about getting started and taking that leap. And, and I really want to bring some actionable advice to, to our audience as well. But before we dive into that, kind of give us a snapshot of what does Bronson Equity look like today? What does your day-to-day -day look like? What does the business look like? Show our listeners kind of what's on the other side of this journey. Yeah, you know, I get that question. There's a movie called um, Office Space where oh, they yeah. have the Bobs that are the consultants, and they go in with this guy and say, "Look, you know, he's trying to tell him what they do, what he does." Yeah. Like, what would you say you do around here? And the guy gets all flustered and says, "I've got the <laughs> skills." When I, sometimes I feel like that, where I'm like, I'm, "I don't know, hey, what do I do?" So people right. think I just do podcasts all day long or create videos, and that's you know, that's part of it. But <laughs> you know, looking at deals, uh, there's a lot of, especially with writing and deep thinking and processing. There's a lot of. I spend a lot of time thinking about the business. So Michael Gerber in his book, The E-Myth talks about, you know, when you have a business, it's important not just to, to work in your business, you should be able to work on your business, right? So you kind of have this above the business approach. You're thinking about it once a quarter, I go away for a couple of days just to kind of think through, I'm getting ready to do it next week and just kind of, well, what, what's working in the business? What's what what's not working? What are the goals for this year? What are the things we should do this quarter? And just really kind of thinking through with our team. Now we've got multiple team members. And so, you know, it's important that I just get clear on what the vision really is. So it's a variety, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that sometimes I'm, you know, I typically, you know, I think three days a week, I'm taking calls from investors, I'm having meetings with potential partners, um, following up on operations of current deals, uh, we're, we're planning for the future. And then a couple of days a week, I usually spend kind of a deeper work type of activities, uh, but it varies, you know, and then I, because I fired myself, I'm able to travel a little more. So I was able to you know, quit my medical sales job. And I, in 2023, I'd had six international trips, right? I just got back from a two and a half week trip to New Zealand, right? So I want to wow. be somebody who's not just talking about the ability to fire yourself and be able to have this passive or investment income. But once you remove the location specific, you can work from anywhere now, but now I'm trying to get to where I don't work. When I travel, I'm just, just going and having a good time. And so that's really allowed for me to actually have more creative space when I come back to be able to create more. So, so that, those are some things that, that I, I found, um, but you know, it, it does vary. We're, we're continuing to try to add value to people, help people to make better in investing decisions, help particularly the passive investor to uh, say, Hey, you know, I've invest, I've got a money person. You know, one of my things in my background, I didn't share with you guys so far as I was a registered investment advisor, which is known as an RIA uh, for a few years. And I just didn't like what I saw about wall street. It just seems like it's really out there trying to, you know, take fees and, and misalignment of interest. A lot of people that manage large in Wall Street funds don't put any money in their in their deals with their investors. And so now I, I call myself an RIA, uh, but instead of you know registered investment advisor, I'm a recovering investment advisor. Right? <laughs> I'm on the other side of that. Where I'm like, well, how can I help people just to be educated on this stuff? So what I continue to think about is how are people that have never done real estate syndication or invested in private equity or other things, how can they get involved in ways and feel comfortable doing it in, 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 in an asset maybe they've never done before. So that's a lot of what I spend time thinking about and doing. And and what is currently with, with Brunson equity, what is, what is, you know, assets under management look like? And then what is, what is, what is your deal? Has your deal flow changed or maybe the way that your outlook has over the past couple of years to the kind of current economy that we're in? Yeah, yeah. So we um, we spent a lot of time uh, you know, looking at different assets. Um, in my book, I talk about how do you vet an asset of any uh, any asset class. So not just you know we've done a lot of multifamily real estate. We've done a lot of other things, but we have shifted a bit to do some real estate, you know, non real estate stuff as well. Uh, we've done 
We raised over $15 million for, um, for ATM machines. We have a large ATM operator we're working with, which has been an awesome cash flow business. We've got car washes, oil and gas type deals. We've got a venture type of deal. We've got a senior housing, new construction deal we're, we're getting ready to launch. Um, so we've got a lot of different things that we're working on. And it comes down to really what is what are the investor goals? What are the you know, what's the upside? And also, what's the downside? What are the risks of doing something like this with uh, real estate? You know, in general, it's, it's gotten a little more tricky with lending. Um, it doesn't mean it's impossible. There are always deals in every um, you know, every market. And so we try to, you know, look, OK, based on these rates and based on what we're doing, does this make sense? Does this, you know, something that works for people? And um, I think, you know, in general, what we've seen is for a lot of people, uh, some of the real estate appetite for deals has has softened a bit. Um, now, you know, ironically, the best time to invest is the time when the least people number of people are interested. So we've seen like quite a few deals that are starting to get much, much better than they were a year or two ago. We used to have deals for large multifamily properties where you get 30 offers at the table and people were going a million dollars non-refundable day one, right? Yeah. We're not seeing that anymore. Now the brokers no. are chasing us down and say, hey, what do you want? You want to do this one or how can this work? Which is a great place to be as a buyer, right? So, um, but it's just trying to convince investors that, hey, you know, um, you know, the whole Warren Buffett saying of be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Um, not that fear or greed are necessarily a great thing, but just, just to have a contrarian approach, right? When everybody's kind of like running out of it, I said, hmm, well, maybe this is actually a good, could be a good time to get into this. So we're seeing that, you know, it, it's starting to develop some really great deals and, and being open to, you know, jumping back fully into real estate, I think is, is really exciting. Oh, 150%. I, I love, this is what I love about doing this podcast and speaking to so many, um, you know, what I consider brilliant minds is, is, is the synergy with which they talk about contrarian investing and things like that. Um, also prudence is always at the forefront. I think of all of our minds when we talk about investing, right. And so what are, what has changed about the way that you underwrite deals having gone through the last few years, seeing what, you know, what, um, unprecedented volatility can do to deals in a, in a crazy market, Going into 2024, where I think we all agree deal flow is going to pick up and the bid ask spread is going to close a little bit, provide some opportunities. Um, what's different about how you're looking at deals from the outset now as opposed to maybe a year and a half, two years ago? Yeah, I think it's, you know, the underwriting just looks a little different. I think this scenario, I mean, it's always uh, the scenario you don't see, you know, sometimes that mm -hmm. creates the risk. I mean, you try to examine, hey, what what do we see as the biggest risk in a deal or things like that? And, and uh, you know, looking back, we, nobody really saw, if you go back a couple of years, you know, nobody first saw that, hey, this is what the Fed's going to do. We're going to be at you know, Fed funds rate of, you know, about five, six percent, you know, in this short amount of time, it's going to be held here. But it, it's been a real shock to the market um, and actually a lot of businesses as well. And so, you know, I think going forward, you know, this is what we say when you buy, and I know you guys are in this business too, but, um, you know, when you buy, your buying price is fixed, but you're interest rate can be adjusted, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the nice thing is, that, hey, let's say I, you know, and I've, I've said this in the past, hey, I'd rather pay, um, you know, buy a property where the price is lower, but the interest rate is higher, be paying more on interest with the ability to refinance later. That's why a lot of people have done very well in real estate over the last 30 years, because there's been this just general sloping downward of rates over the last 30 years. And so same with the bond markets, it kind of worked out the same way. So I think going forward in, in 2024, um, you know, I think I think there's a lot of interesting things. I think they're starting to become some deals that are are either distressed or just are, there is more distress in the market, or even people that maybe have not wanted to sell but now are kind of maybe have to sell or have to find a way, whether it's in commercial or even residential. People that want to move or things like that. So I think it's um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it opens up for investors. Um, I think there's always opportunity in every market, but I do think that, um, you know, coming, we're coming into just a really, really good time. I think the next six to 12 months is going to look really nice. And uh, at least for, for getting new deals, for sure. Agreed. A hundred percent. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm, can... I'm interested in, in hearing, I mean, you got me, I just texted, you know, our, our partnership group and I was like, I was like, man, this dude's raised over $15 million for an say, ATM, uh, an ATM the, portfolio. There was something, uh, <laughs> ironic about atms being such a cash flowing business i don't know what the, the irony in that is very funny to me i love that well, yeah and, and <laughs> it's a print cash you know like print money exactly yeah and, and so is there you know you said you're you you have that you've got oil and gas you've got car washes is there a favorite what is your favorite asset class and and is there something that you're you know because you're you're you've got your hands a little bit in 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 a lot of things is there something yeah. that you're seeing that's going to have a stronger trend over the next several years 
So, you know, my favorite, I, used, I, I you know, I've had now, uh, it's actually been 1,500 one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls with investors individually over the last, you know, four years, four or five years. Wow. Um, and, and I ask a lot of people, you know, what's more important? One of the questions I ask is, what's more important for you, cash flow or appreciation? And a lot of people be like, oh, yeah, I got you both or maybe, you know, cash flow. Wow. They're not really sure. And I've gotten to the place where I just believe 100% that cash flow is far superior to appreciation. I'm gonna explain why. Um, you know, making lots of money someday, we do have some deals that are like potential 10 to 100X type of thing, you know, they're very, they're more speculative, you know, that's great. But, you know, if that comes through, that's wonderful, but it may or may not come through, right? Cash flow today allows you to be able to cover your mortgage or be able to cover your car payment or to leave a job, right? Because you're getting cash flow from that deal. And that's the thing that really typically Wall Street doesn't offer. Maybe something in dividend stocks or certain things that give some cash flow, but usually it's way lower. But in a lot of these deals, and that's uh, why I like the ATM fund is it's been the most consistent cash flowing investment, at least to this point that I've seen. Now, could it change or could it, of course it could, but um, you know, deals like that that produce this consistent monthly or quarterly cash flow, I think those really are far superior to just making a lot of money someday or something that works in five years or something like that, because that's what allows you actually to fire yourself, right? It's like if I have, so if I was making 200K a year, but my, my spend for me to live was about 70K, 60, 70K a year, right? So five, you know, 6K a month was what I needed to cover my living expenses. So for me to get cash flow to cover that, was far easier, right? To get to 60, 70 K in, in investment income versus covering 200 K, right? So just even focusing on the right thing and getting cash flow that covers that. And so that's where I learned that, you know, passive income or investment income is far superior to how much you make in a job. People can be making half a million or a million dollars a year. I talk about this in the book. I've got a couple of doctors that were making over $2 million a year each, but they were working 60 to 80 hours a week, every week, and weren't even hardly able to take vacations because if they didn't show up to work, they weren't getting paid. So that's that time for money trade, right? And if you can get out of that, even if you're creating you know, $5,000 a year in passive income, it typically will grow next year because of appreciation or things will grow, or you invest more or whatever. And then you keep scaling that up to where uh, you cover your rat race number, you cover the number you need to be able to live. So I think that's something a lot of people don't really don't really get. And so the best investment is with those that cash flow and they cash flow consistently. I love it. You're speaking my love language. Yes, you I are. Mean, I was, I was about to like, say. All right. <laughs> you know, I, I, 40 minutes in, I perked right up on that one because that that is, you know, we do a lot of times in this business is delayed gratification, right? We keep kicking the can down the road. And there's a lot of times, you know, we'll hear, what's your net worth, bro? Yeah. You know, what do you, what are you net worth over there? You're not even a yeah. millionaire yet? How much are you net worth over there, <laughs> man? Do you even, do you even net worth <laughs> at all? And, and, you know, and look, I fell into that trap. My brothers, we fell into that trap big and, and, you know, and, and, but if you looked at the cash flow on it, it was, man, it was not, it wasn't sexy. How did you how did you get into that mindset right away? And then again, a lot of a lot of opportunities aren't necessarily strong cash flow plays. They're appreciation or value adds. Like, was there somebody that taught you that, or was there a mentor? Or you just had that mindset being you know uh, and you know recovering investment person. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. It, honestly, sometimes I feel looking back, I feel like I'm a slow learner because it's like it takes me a while to get this stuff. But I mean, the nice thing is over time, you know, as you have conversations, as you learn, as you read books, as you do these things, it's kind of like, huh, that's really interesting. Like, OK, yeah, I could make a lot of money, but that doesn't really like even. And as I've seen, you know, just through experience, like, OK, a deal comes matures and I get one hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's great. But like I've got to redeploy that, and what's actually going to start producing cash flow for myself? Now, kind of up on the side, you can't see it, but I've got the Cash Flow One Hundred and One board game here uh, oh, yeah. by Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. Which, if you've played the game, if you have, if you have kids, um, and they're kind of you know maybe approaching teenage years or maybe a little before that, have your kids play this game. There's actually a kids one too, and basically what it does is the whole thing is to try to just kind of do what I said: is how do you create enough income from your investments? to cover your rat race number. And there's some people that it's a great teaching game because some people are uh, doctors and they, you know, their, their spend is $200,000 a year on what is their lifestyle. But another guy who's like the mechanic, he only spend, you know, 40 K a year or less, right? He's spending less money on himself so he can actually invest more and get out of the rat race sooner. So, you know, there's two parts of that equation. One is how much you make. The other is how much you spend. And that comes back to the book, the riches, man in Babylon, right? Is you know, the miserable is a person who spends even just a little bit more than what they make. And so, you know, if you can just be somebody who's a saver, who's an investor and puts money in, 
Um, but I, I think, you know, how did I get that? I think it was just over time seeing how investments actually work and, and seeing also in the last couple of years, some investments that, you know, looked amazing on paper, but they don't always perform the way that you hope. And when you have a cash flowing investment, it actually reduces your risk. Uh, as soon as you start getting cash, right? Your cash is actually being, or your, your risk is actually being reduced as you're receiving cash from the investment, because then you can also go to redeploy it, right? So I think there's just a lot of things when it comes to just managing how you, you know, how you invest and as you learn. But, um, you know, again, if you want to leave a job, which most people do, or at least have the, want to have the ability, if I sell my business, if I stop practicing medicine, if I don't go to work, am I able to generate enough cash? And a lot of people don't know how to do that. And so that's the, you know, again, the Warren Buffett, I quote like crazy, but the Warren Buffett, the idea of making money while you sleep. If you don't figure out how to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. Now, ironically, Warren Buffett is over 90 and he still works, right? <laughs> but he works the way he wants to, right? So it's not like, hey, we just retire. We don't do anything and sit on a beach with a Mai Tai, which sounds great for a week or a few days or something, but to have to be able to be able to pursue your purpose and why you're here on this earth. And so that's what I feel cash flow is able enables you to do. I love that, man. I appreciate you sharing that because I, I want to just kind of emphasize that for the listeners as well, right? When you're analyzing deals, the cash on cash return, I think, is one of those things as as far as a a, a risk uh, mitigator that I think flies under the radar. The higher your actual cash flow, your cash on cash return, we'll just call it that, the more that it, it mitigates the risks of the other variables for the other types of returns, your IRR, your annualized return, your equity multiplier, right? Those things are great when you dispo the asset and it hits and you get that big chunk of cash at the end. Um, but if a business plan doesn't go the way that it's supposed to, those things don't always come through. When you buy a cash flowing asset, that's there. You know, that's that's money in your pocket every month or quarter or however often you do distribution. So that, that, that offsets a lot of the other types of risk that come along um, with deals. I want to ask one sort of actionable question and be respectful of your time as we kind of start to wrap things up here. You've had over 1,500 conversations with investors now over the last four years. That's how you've been able to raise so much money. And I think that lead generation aspect of things is something that uh, we as investors, it's an obstacle we have trouble getting over. It's having enough conversations with people to potentially become partners, LPs, raise money, help them build wealth. One, what does that lead generation strategy look like for you? Where do you even find 1,500 people? And what does an outline of that conversation look like? What questions do you ask? How do you find if it's the right fit? Yeah. So the first question is, how do I get more investors? Or how do I get people to actually set up calls with me or want to invest with me? Like, yeah, how do you do that? And it's you mentioned this uh, earlier in the show. We talked about the thought leadership platform, right? And so... Uh, you know, a lot of times what will happen or how it actually works is through a podcast like this, right? If you start a podcast, you start a meetup, you have webinars, you write a book, you create a, a lead magnet, you have something where people are drawn to you, then what will happen is, uh, you know, we have, if somebody goes to my website, Bronson Equity, uh, dot com, you'll find there's a free download, right? And we give the first chapter of our book away or we give different things out. And so people can download it. So there's an exchange, right? They give their email over. And then uh, they get a, a free resource that they'll find value in, right? And so people do that. And when they do that, then we basically say, hey, thanks so much. Here's a free resource. And also, this is what we do. And then we start educating them on the business, right? Because the resource is, hey, you're, you want to fire yourself? Here's how you do it, right? Here's step one, two, three. Here's how I did it. I start telling those stories. Then I start educating. And what happens is over time, um, whether it's through a podcast like this, uh, I remember the partner I had actually, uh, I mentioned the partner that we raised 15 million together. Uh, when I first met him, I remember going up to him and just being like, hey, man, how's it going? I just was all a little gregarious, right? I'm a little bit gregarious anyway, but I went up and I said, hey, man, how's it going? And I realized like there was it really interesting, like I, I was meeting him for the first time, but I'd spent hours and hours and hours with him through the podcast and through his resources, right? So I felt like I knew him. Right. So it's just interesting when you're when you're looking to raise money, it's not just like you have to go to dinners and take people out, whatever. And that's kind of the old school way to do it where you raise money. Well, now you can have instead of one to one, you can have one to many. Right. So it's this idea of being able to reach out to many. And so um, we think of it like a funnel. Right. So the first step of the funnel is you get people in your network. Maybe they follow you on social media. They keep watching a video. They listen to a podcast. Second thing is they get opted in into your your lead magnet or your network or an event or something like that. And then from there, in every email, we're always telling them if they haven't, there's a way you can kind of organize people so you know if they've had a call with you. And you say, well, schedule a call, schedule a call, join the join the club, join the investment club, join the investment club. And eventually people are just like, oh, I should join the club. And they click and they schedule something, right? So then I have that call. So you ask, you know, what does that call look like? 
Well, I typically, you know, having so many calls now, it's become pretty, you know, okay, this is the process to take people through is very quickly. I'm trying to figure out who am I talking with on the phone? Is this somebody who's done 30 syndicated deals and we're going to have a call, a higher level conversation around, uh, you know, cap rate, reversion and exit and just some very technical things like because that's typically a more advanced investor will do that. Or is this somebody who's, uh, you know, a doctor who has a five million dollar net worth who's never invested in anything but stocks and has a money guy that manages yeah. their money? Right. That's those are different conversations. That conversation is going to be much more about here's how what syndication is. Here's how it works. Here's who we are. And, you know, I have metrics. So it's only about, you know, 17 percent of those conversations actually convert into people actually investing. So there's a lot of education. There's a lot of talking, but they're very valuable conversations because the average investor invests typically seventy five to one hundred thousand dollars. Right. If they actually do invest. So, I mean, I guess there's a process we take people through. I'll ask them, you know, how did you hear about us? Uh, you know, tell me about your who you like just a little about you, your your occupation, uh, any investing experience. And then we walk them through, you know, what's more important, cash flow or appreciation? What's your, you know, your net worth? Are you accredited? And then, you know, here's what we do. Does this fit your goals? And then we kind of go from there, kind of depending on where they want to go. So I kind of take them through a process because I'm trying to figure out who they are, get some information about them, what their goals are, and then say, okay, well, this is how we could work together. Or maybe we're not the best fit. Maybe you should, you know, try someone else. But anyway, I can help you get where you want to go. I want to do, I want to be in, I want to be in that space trying to help people get where they want to go. Love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Brunson, for that. There's one last thing that I want to bring up. He doesn't talk about this, but this is at the very bottom of his website. He's a singer-songwriter that has composed over 75 songs. What? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, what is? Man, I wish we had known that in advance. Yeah, I know. I, I, I was scrolling down. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. What is this? Okay. Uh, so what? What's the? So the songs that you write and you compose. What's that genre? I was just actually write one about the More Doors podcast. The More hey. Doors podcast, where you go to get your education and make some <laughs> yeah. you know, jingle, right? Um, no, I actually now it's over a hundred songs, and uh, yeah, so I, I I write occasionally. Sometimes I write. I just over the years, well, for a while, I wanted to be a professional musician or songwriter, and sometimes a singer songwriter kind of stuff. I have you know a breakup a few years ago, so it was like love songs and heartbreak songs, and then okay. other times I write some kind of like Christian worship songs. And so I just kind of write whatever, you know, I'm feeling. And it's just amazing when you write, it can really become like therapy where you're, um, you know, you're just expressing your your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your uh, spirituality. And music is a great tool that just kind of really uh, opens up. Maybe I should do, maybe it'll help me raise more money if I write song. if I just went to writing songs on social media. Sure. Right? <laughs> that's awesome, man. I love it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's some creative stuff, man. We've never songs. had a singer songwriter on any of our shows no. that we know about. That we know about. Oh. That's for sure. That's awesome, man. Very <laughs> cool. Well, where, where can where, well, one as we wrap up, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? And buy and, the book, and then yeah, obviously buy the book. Fire yourself. Um, and I do want to know where I can find your music as well. But where can where can people find Bronson Equity? <laughs> Yeah, so you can, uh, my best place is my website, bronsonequity.com. Um, it's a free download there for the first chapter of the book. Uh, if you want to buy it, it's on Amazon and where you buy books. Um, also, I'm on all the social medias. So you can just search Bronson Hill. Love connecting with folks about investing, about, you know, learning about reducing taxes and all kinds of, you know, vetting deals and all that stuff. So love connecting with folks. If you want to connect, love to connect. And thanks so much for having me, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, likewise, man. Absolutely, man. Episode 26 in the books. No, we're going to use Bronson who talked about just creating content and yeah. and podcasts and one to many. And and he was really speaking. That was an endorsement for two, TorStudios.com and Jesse and, and having that because that's part of the reason why we started this show as mm -hmm. well is to, the one to many uh, platform and be able to selfishly educate ourselves yep. and learn from what everyone else is doing. And then two, they get to listen in on this. So, exactly. um, And then when they're doing that they should go to because if they're interested in investing or learning what uh what we are doing all they have to do is go over to, to deep blue re.com that's deep blue capital that's a that's a company that brian matt and i own and and uh have some uh some great investments under there so yeah. deep blue re.com bronson thank you so much buddy it this was amazing makes me want to own uh some atms <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome, thanks so much great being here thanks again absolutely so, thanks, check out bronson equity check out fire yourself man we've got to have you back on soon we appreciate the time brother thanks brother thanks guys